Hello, my name is Tamar Friedman, Director of Peer Programs at Jewish Funders Network. And on behalf of JFN, I'm happy to welcome you today to today's webinar on the topic of will the March elections bring an end to Israel's political and economic crisis? We are fortunate to be joined today by leaders of the Israel Dem Dem Democracy Institute who will discuss this, the stakes and possible outcomes of Israel's fourth, fourth election in less than two years. Now it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Jesse Ferris, Vice President of Strategy at the Israel Democracy Institute, who will introduce today's speaker and frame and moderate today's conversation. Thank you so much, Jesse. Thank you, Tamar, and thanks to Andres and Marsha and the leadership of JFN for hosting this timely conversation. I understand there's quite a, a following out there, to, so hello to, to all of you. Um, I want to take a moment at the outset to pay tribute to former Secretary of State George Shultz, who, as many of you probably know, passed away over the weekend, just six weeks after his 100th birthday. Uh, Shultz was a giant who will go down in history as one of the most influential statesmen of the 20th century, no doubt. Um, we at IDI were extremely fortunate to count him as a friend. Schultz helped found the Institute shortly after stepping down as Secretary of State because of his respect for the Jewish people and his deep concern over their ability, as he put it, to maintain a free society under permanent siege. Um, he established our International Advisory Council in the early 2000s and, and chaired it until he really could no longer travel. His last trip to Israel for an IDI conference was in the spring of 2016. We threw a dinner with the Prime Minister at the King David in his honor. But the interesting bit I want to share with you is a short story you won't read about in the obituaries, I don't think, and which sheds some light on George's special connection to, to Israel. Back in the 1960s, George Schultz was dean at the University of Chicago. And at the end of every semester, he and his wife would hold a special reception for those outstanding students who made the dean's list. Two who always showed up were Joseph Levy, a promising young graduate student from Israel, and his wife. Schultz had marked out Yossi as a special kid who was going somewhere. And this was May 1967. And when Yossi didn't show up at the reception, Schultz made inquiries and found out that he had gone back to Israel to uh, deal with the tensions with, uh, with Egypt on the Israel border. A few weeks later, Schultz heard that Yossi had been killed in action in the fighting over Jerusalem. This was his first real connection to Israel, and he would later recall thinking to himself, what an extraordinary nation that commands such talent. Several years later, when Schultz joined government as Secretary of Labor, made his first trip to Israel, he insisted on being taken directly from the airport to Levy's grave. But the story doesn't end there. As it happens, Joseph Levy's wife was pregnant at the time of his death. And soon after the war, she gave birth to a boy who of course never got to meet his father. Fast forward half a century. In early 2016, as we were preparing to fly the 95-year-old Schultz to Israel, which is a story in and of itself, we spent several months tracking down Joseph Levy's son, Nadav, who turned out to be hiding in plain sight as a lecturer at the IDC. And so we arranged for a meeting with him and his mother at the King David. Now, apparently the son is the spitting image of the father that he never knew. As you can imagine, the reunion was very emotional and we were all fighting back tears. From the King David, we hopped into a taxi, headed over to Ramona Nassib, where Nadav walked the aging Secretary of State to a monument commemorating his father and the others who fell in the battle for Jerusalem 50 years before. It was quite a moment. Uh, we returned from there to a special dinner with the King, uh, at the King David with the Prime Minister, uh, where the levies were given a standing ovation by the Prime Minister himself. Uh, so that's just one of many, many memories that we have. He's told us a lot of stories over the, over the uh, years, and I'm sure we'll uh, find a proper way to disseminate some of them. Uh, I'm joined by two colleagues today, um, uh, Karnit Flug, uh, Vice President for Research at IDI and the immediate past uh, Governor of the Bank of Israel, uh, and Yochanan Flester, who we are probably more familiar with from previous briefings, the President of IDI. Yochanan, before we uh, talk shop, do you want to share a few thoughts about the passing of Secretary Schultz? Yeah, first of all, I was there. It's actually the monument that you mentioned uh, was uh, it, where the actual battle took place. So it's actually the, the actual location in Armona Natsiv in East Jerusalem uh, where Yosef uh, Levy uh, died uh, in battle. And Secretary Schultz uh, uh, wanted to actually see that location. And that was so moving about him uh, as a... Uh, 
he, he usually labeled himself uh, a Marine. And as a, and as a true Marine, he, he wanted to actually had a, a, you know, both feet on the ground and at the same time, uh, such an inspiring thought leader, uh, such an intellectual uh, with, with such perspective. And we were so fortunate uh, to have him as our uh, uh, international chairman for so many years. Uh, one of his uh, mod modest gift to the state of Israel was the idea of helping found an institute that would provide uh, uh, the decision-making circles in Israel an ability to make decisions based on uh, evidence, data, analysis, uh, uh, comparative uh, research. And he really set the foundations of our institute and, uh, and uh, we're, we're so uh, uh, proud, uh, proud and elevated to have uh, uh, such a, a monumental legacy. And he really deserves, I mean, people of, of this kind are, you know, one of a kind and uh, I'm not sure I will ever meet uh, uh, a leader with, uh, with such magnitude. Thank you, Yohanan. And now um, to the topic at hand. So we're six weeks out from Israel's fourth election in two years. Uh, last time we were promised that third time the charm, which translates roughly into Hebrew as Pam Shlishit Glida. Um, well, clearly the charm didn't work. Um, and if the polls are anything to judge by, we may be facing the prospect of a fifth or sixth election at some point in the coming months um, that those possibilities can't be ruled out. One factor is clearly different uh, from the previous round and maybe a potential game changer. And that of course is the coronavirus. So let's start with that. Um, Karnit, Israel is of course, as many of us know, racing ahead with the vaccinations, but still under lockdown. And there seems to be no end in sight. Uh, can you give us a general sense of the impact of the pandemic, both from a health perspective and an economic one as a backdrop to our conversation about the upcoming elections? Thank you, Jesse, and it's a pleasure to be uh, in this uh, webinar. So let me start with the health uh, situation. And actually, we're just coming out of the third lockdown very gradually. And uh, the number of new cases still seems to be very high, uh, in spite of the fact that we've had a very uh, rapid and successful so far a operation of the vaccination. Now 40% of our population is already vaccinated and about 90% of the general non-Haredi, non-Arab population over 60 is already either vaccinated or had been uh, uh, sick before. So they're uh, apparently immune. There is large variation across uh, populations where the, uh, both the Arab community and the Haredi community uh, have much higher number of cases uh, and also are less uh, uh, willing to get vaccinated. So the numbers there actually of people getting uh, the vaccine is lower. Uh, I think there is quite a disappointment uh, with the fact that the number of new cases has not declined as was expected in spite of the vaccination. And it seems that the British variant uh, is uh, uh, responsible for that. But also the fact that for uh, many reasons, it seems that the adherence to the restrictions of the lockdown was much lower than before. There is some kind of, uh, uh, I guess, lockdown fatigue. Uh, and people are uh, actually have not uh, uh, followed all the uh, restrictions. Uh, so we're in a situation where we're actually coming out of the lockdown, uh, but the capacity of uh, hospitals uh, is, uh, they're close to full capacity to deal with uh, the uh, um, uh, difficult cases. People in ICU and on ventilators are more or less at the full capacity. So uh, we're, it's a difficult situation. The hope is that as the vaccine uh, is uh, given to more and more people, uh, the numbers will start going down, which hasn't happened uh, so far. Uh, on the economic front, uh, the situation in Israel is 
uh, I guess, to some extent, not quite as severe as in uh, other advanced economies. In 2020, our GDP decline was 3.7%, which is somewhat milder decline than in other advanced economies. But if you take into account that our population grows much faster, so the per capita decline was actually quite similar to that in uh, the other advanced economies. What shielded the economy to some extent is the structure uh, of the economy. We have a relatively a large high tech sector that didn't suffer as a result of the pandemic. In fact, it saw a, a growing demand to its uh, services. And we have a relatively modest tourism sector than in other places actually pulled down the economy. So our structure shielded us to some extent. However, uh, I guess the main concern right now is the very high unemployment rate. Uh, now, actually, or at the heights of the uh, lockdown, unemployment was close to uh, 24%. We will probably see a decline as uh, sectors are opening up. But the main concern is that we will uh, remain with a elevated unemployment uh, uh, situation where most of the, of the unemployed are people with lower education, lower income, and the, um, the uh, economic crisis uh, hit the, the weaker population in a disproportionate way. So I, I guess this is the main challenge for the uh, government uh, looking forward. Thank you. So Johan and Karnit paints a pretty bleak picture of the impact of the uh, pandemic. But of course, if we sort of look back for a second on 2020, that was just sort of overlaid. The pandemic was overlaid on, a, on, on what we're calling a perfect storm, three inconclusive elections, the unprecedented event of a prime minister on trial. Then you get the pandemic with its health and economic effects. Uh, and here we are in February 2021, still emerging from a third uh, nationwide lockdown and political deadlock that seems as tight as ever. So what's the mood right now as we head to these next elections? How do Israelis feel about their government and the country as a whole? Well, if we thought that our situation, Jesse, is uh, like a feature fil film that no uh, script writer would ever uh, dare writing because it would be so inconceivable and unimaginable, well, now it turns out to be a TV series because it's, it's too long for one feature film. It's a an election after an election. Now we're heading towards the fourth election on, on March 23rd. And I, I, I wanna say a few words about the mood of Israelis as reflected in the democracy index that uh, we presented to the uh, president of the state of Israel, Ruby Rivlin, just uh, a few weeks ago. Um, uh, but before that, it's important to say, you know, we are about, uh, 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 we started our conversation with uh, a, a photograph that uh, embodies or tells a larger story, the photograph of George Schultz uh, 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 in the battlefield. Uh, well, this morning we had another picture, Mr. Netanyahu pleading not guilty uh, in court. And this is really the gist of the, of the political deadlock, the political story that led us to a three and now to a fourth uh, election campaign and it's, uh, uh, we, can be, uh, we can state quite confidently that as long as the, the, the crisis, the, the deadlock will end in one of two uh, events. Either Mr. Netanyahu will be able to achieve a, major, a solid majority of 61 and above, and then be able to legislate his way out of the legal process, uh, whether it's immunity, firing the attorney general, basically dodging the legal uh, uh, process, and in due course, and as a result, also a wrecking serious havoc on our democratic institutions and regimes. Some of the ideas that Mr. Netanyahu has in mind in order to subvert the independence of the judiciary can have long-term destructive repercussions. And this is to some extent what's at stake in the elections right now. And option number two is that uh, uh, a government will be able to form without Mr. Netanyahu. Uh, and, uh, and it will be, even if that will uh, take place, it will be 
very difficult to form the government. And we might talk about it uh, uh, a little uh, later in this discussion. And, and of course, uh, deadlock is also an option. Now, those numbers here demonstrate, now we, we want to sort of briefly talk about a few aspects of what is the mood of Israelis right now? Well, Israelis apparently uh, uh, think that the democratic system in Israel is in grave danger in large numbers. So the, uh, the, the overall number is 58% of all Israelis think that the, uh, the democratic system is in grave danger. Obviously it varies if you self-identify yourself as a, as a left-wing supporter, as a centrist, or as a right-wing supporter, but overall Israelis are not optimistic about uh, uh, the future of our democracy. And for us, it's a, it's a, it, it's a reflection of the state of, of the mood. And it's also a, a, a sign of uh, alarm uh, that calls us for action to strengthen, preserve uh, our democracy. In terms of trust of Israelis in our uh, institutions, um, the, the, those are the levels of trust uh, uh, between uh, uh, both uh, uh, Jews and Arabs and, uh, and the, the differences between uh, uh, October and June. Uh, and obviously we see uh, that in some cases there was a, a quite a serious decline in, in, in October. And generally we're seeing, if we compare it uh, to the numbers that we've been gathering since 2003, we're at an all time low when it comes to trust in our public institutions, the, the lowest level of, of trust is in, in the democratically elected institutions, party, parties, Knesset, government, uh, and the media that also serves an important democratic role. All of those institutions are at an all time low if we compare it uh, you know, 18 years uh, uh, in a sequence of uh, 18 years uh, ago. And in this respect, uh, and when we look at the levels of solidarity between Israelis, uh, between the different groups in Israeli society, we also see that the level of solidarity is, 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 is also at an all time low. And, and this is a, 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 a diametrically opposed to the attitude that existed in June after the first lockdown. As, as we can see here in this chart, after the first lockdown, there was a sense of solidarity as is the uh, typical, as is typical for Israel and Israelis uh, during times of crisis, we get together. Uh, but uh, as we uh, slid into the second lockdown and the third lockdown, and it was impossible for the government to uh, implement a, a, a differential uh, a policy of restrictions in, in, in red uh, cities uh, to have high levels of re restrictions and in green cities uh, to allow for a uh, higher degrees of flexibility. The government was not able for political reasons to apply a differential policy, mainly uh, because of the uh, uh, political alliance uh, with the ultra-Orthodox parties, which uh, 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 forbade it from uh, 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 applying any sort of uh, effective restriction vis-a-vis -vis the ultra-Orthodox community. So if to sum up, Jesse, uh, on the one hand, we have, we're rolling out a, a phenomenal success of the vaccine uh, 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 operation, a logistical operational success and acquiring the vaccinations and so on. And Karnit uh, touched on the numbers. And on the other hand, uh, 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 disappointing, not, not to say heartbreaking failure in applying any kind of coherent policy of uh, of a differential policy of restrictions, which is uh, uh, what is uh, required. And as a result, Israelis are, are in a sense of flux and the national mood is bad. So, Karnid, obviously part of the this worrying decline in public trust that Yohanan just described is due to perceived failure on the part of the government to deal effectively with the crisis. Uh, can you elaborate on some of the steps that the government has taken? What have they done well? What have they done less well and, and why? Okay, so uh, first of all, the government did introduce a very uh, large package of uh, uh, expenditures. Uh, some went to uh, providing a social safety net uh, 
to the unemployed and to the uh, self-employed that actually uh, lost uh, a lot of their income and to businesses. I think in terms of the um, overall uh, safety net, uh, the uh, provisions for the unemployed, which extended and expanded the unemployment benefit was quite, uh, was quite comprehensive and quite adequate. Uh, I think with the self-employed, the ability to actually provide uh, sufficient uh, compensation for the loss of income was more limited and the processes to actually get the support to the self-employed and to uh, businesses was quite cumbersome and quite slow. So that actually created a, a lot of frustration and, uh, and that, that was, I, I would say, a, a point of, uh, um, um, that was much less successful. Uh, but I think in terms of the public trust, the most damaging uh, 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 action or lack of action was the fact that the budget was not passed. Mm -hmm. And actually the government is operating with the continuous budget that was designed in 2018 uh, and with special allocations, which we called budgetary boxes, in which the government actually uh, allocates uh, resources for these safety nets and special, uh, special spendings in order to deal with the pandemic. But this uh, process of actually allocating the resources doesn't go through the normal sort of process of scrutiny, uh, which normal budget procedures go through, and the failure to actually pass a budget due to political considerations, I think was very detrimental, both in terms of the public trust, but also in terms of the um, of, uh, poly of adequate policy, because a budget would be designed so as to have the priorities uh, that would be the most efficient ways to deal with the uh, with the economic crisis, and the way uh, actually things were done was in a much less efficient way. Um, and for example, one element of the package that I didn't mention before was uh, handouts to the whole population, regardless of whether uh, people were actually hurt by the economic crisis or continued to get either their pension or their uh, salaries uh, normally. And quite a large, uh, a, a large uh, sum was allocated for these general hand handouts that are inefficient, are uh, unjust, and are very, very costly. And I think this is an example where actually the fact that we're in this continuous uh, election process and the government wants to be popular, uh, does things that are considered populist and uh, are not uh, really appreciated and that actually damages the trust. There are other elements which are very important that were not part of the package and that includes uh, vocational training on a large scale and large investments that are what is really needed now uh, in order to sort of jumpstart the economy uh, when we are sort of getting out of the uh, of the lockdown and the crisis. Maybe I should clarify a point about the budget to, to, to our viewers. If you sort of clear through the smoke screen, the passage of a budget was the last roadblock before fulfilling the rotation agreement between uh, Benjamin Netanyahu and Benjamin Gantz, which would have ceded the premiership to, to Gantz come November. And it was deliberately not removed. And as a result, the, uh, the government fell or, and was or if we're going to election. Uh, Johanna, so let's, let's talk politics with, with that background in mind. So it's really only been a year since the last election, but it seems that the political map has changed completely, or has it? I mean, we have the emergence of Guidon Sarr's arrival on the right, uh, blue and white collapsing on the center left. Uh, we also have a question from the audience about what's going on with, in, in, with the Arab parties and the possible role that they might play after the elections. We know there's been some, some movement there. So I know Israeli politics could be confusing. Can you give us a breakdown of who the main players are this time around? And I know it's early days. The polls aren't, aren't necessarily determinative, but what, what can we tell from the polls about what we might see after March 23rd? 
Well, if in the previous Knesset we saw a consolidation uh, to some extent of the uh, uh, political system, and we ended up with uh, eight uh, uh, parties in the Knesset altogether uh, in the elections of March 2020, now what we see here in the in the slide are uh, 12 different parties. So we're up by 50 percent in terms of number of parties, and Israeli politics is again as fragmented as ever. Uh, although we raised the threshold to 3.25, which is uh, relatively high compared to Israel's history. And nevertheless, we have a, 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 a phenomenal number of parties, uh, uh, 12 parties that are now based on the polls, uh, uh, have a reasonable chance of passing. There is even a 13th one, which I haven't include, included, but it has some uh, likelihood. So so what have, uh, so why have we uh, organized the, uh, 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 the map in this way. Well, on the left, we see the uh, Just Not uh, BB camp, and uh, it is comprised of uh, uh, six uh, different uh, uh, parties. And uh, what's most interesting to note that out of those six, three are at some risk of not, pass not crossing the uh, threshold for entering into the Knesset and thereby a potential of wasting hundreds of thousands of votes. I'm, I'm uh, alluding specifically to Gantz's Blue and White Party that in the last elections was uh, uh, with competing with the Likud on the status of largest party around 35 seats. And now they're consistently struggling with a threshold at around uh, uh, four seats. Uh, same with the uh, uh, Meretz party that last time ran together with labor. And therefore uh, 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 this experience was quite traumatic for them because their joint power was less than the um, uh, uh, addition of both parties, but they were very, they very safely crossed the threshold. This time Meretz again is around uh, four seats, again, very close to the threshold and at a survival risk as well. Uh, the Labour Party reinvented itself with the new leadership of Merav Michaeli and, uh, and is now uh, celebrating at around six seats, uh, but uh, Analysts and observers uh, uh, note that the differences between labor and merits are not that great as two parties. And once the initial momentum uh, of labor uh, uh, after the, the post uh, primaries momentum uh, uh, wanes, uh, then labor might also be at a risk of not crossing. But anyway, those three parties are at some level of risk. Uh, um, uh, uh, we have the joint uh, uh, list that uh, broke up into joint list and Ram, which is the Islamist element within the joint list. Interestingly, we included Ram not in the just not BB camp because there's an interesting develop the, uh, development there. Uh, Mr. Mansour Abbas, the leader of that uh, faction, indicates that he's uh, uh, available for business and, uh, and uh, including with Mr. Netanyahu. And it will be ironic that if Mr. Netanyahu will need the Ram figures and Ram will actually cross the threshold, something that is not clear yet, uh, Netanyahu might end up securing his premiership uh, with the Ram vote, something that he absolutely delegitimized when uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Gantz was considering doing it uh, 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 back in March. So this is the irony, Netanyahu that sort of built to some extent a career on on, on, on delegitimizing the participation of the Arab MKs in, uh, in a coalition government uh, is uh, uh, now beginning to leg legitimize this uh, potential participation. Yohanan, the, the term uh, strange bedfellows comes to mind. Yeah, yeah. but um, uh, 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 probably a more consequential development with, uh, with respect to the joint list in Ram party that if uh, in the current Knesset, they have 15 seats and, uh, and the level of participation in the election was around 65%, close to the level of participation of Jewish voters and, and an all the reflection of an all time high, at least in the past 20 years, uh, the disappointment with it, with the, within the uh, uh, Arab uh, uh, citizens uh, from the breakup of the joint list and other factors lead to the fact that we expect a significant decline in the participation. And, uh, and that means that one of those two parties, the Ram party, is at the risk of not crossing the threshold. And in such a case, uh, Arab, uh, the, the representation of the Arab minority might plummet uh, 
uh, from a high of 15 down to perhaps seven if Ram doesn't cross or a nine or 10 as is re uh, uh, reflected in the polls today. So it's a big, big change. It also changes the relationship between the blocks and increases Mr. Netanyahu's chance of achieving 61. A new hope, Gidon Sal's uh, party who led away from the Likud, created a right-wing party uh, that does not uh, recognize or accept uh, uh, Netanyahu's uh, uh, leadership given his conduct uh, uh, with respect to his legal proceedings and so on is uh, again changing the dynamics because for the first time it, it seems like the, one of the contenders for the premiership is challenging Mr. Netanyahu not from the center left but rather from the right and we're seeing that uh, uh, although Yair Lapid's Yesh Atid party uh, seems to have a few more seats uh, based on the polls today Gidon Sal's uh, numbers for fit for premiership are uh, 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 a lot closer to Mr. Netanyahu. And in this respect, he's considered by the Israeli public as challenging Mr. Netanyahu. It's, it's quite a messy situation. Finally, Amina, Mr. Bennett's party is also, we're not considering him in Mr. Netanyahu's pocket because he claims that he's running himself for the premiership and refuses to uh, uh, commit uh, 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 whether he will support Netanyahu or any other potential government. So Netanyahu really relies on his uh, uh, ultra-Orthodox uh, uh, allies uh, as his true partners. Netanyahu's base of support of the Likud is pretty solid and, and stable. Obviously, the ultra-Orthodox parties have a solid uh, support that is a reflection of the demographic size of the, of, uh, of the ultra-Orthodox population. And, and, and this explains why this election is... Uh, is, is still a, a, a close call. And, uh, and this also might explain uh, the difficulty in applying uh, a differential uh, uh, policy with respect to uh, uh, the COVID crisis when we see how reliant Mr. Netanyahu is on those parties and the uh, ultra-Orthodox politicians and rabbis. That's, it's a very interesting uh, perspective. Usually we're used to looking at Israeli politics as right, center, and left along a security uh, access that doesn't seem to be uh, the main deciding factor. In this case, it's really, are you for or against the prime minister? And, and given this diagram, it really looks like uh, Naftali Bennett and the Amina party um, have a lot of power as potential kingmakers in the aftermath, um, uh, depending on the results, uh, of course. Um, yes. uh, uh, so Jesse, actually, some, some analysts say that Naftali Bennett, even though he's expected to have, you know, around 10 seats, perhaps a little less, perhaps a little more, but because of his kingmaker position, he might actually even uh, uh, manage to leverage it into making himself the king after the election. So this is a, not a, an inconceivable scenario. And, and I, you know, observing and, and being part of Israeli politics for so many years, I, I cannot remember such a, 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 a political, uh, such a messy political uh, situation. And again, it's an outcome of two years of a messy political reality. Thank you. Uh, I want to encourage everyone, we're about halfway through, to use the chat function or the Q&A uh, function to, to pose questions, and we'll do our best to, to, to get to them. Uh, maybe just a short follow-up question to you, Yochan. I'll turn back to Tony in a second. Um, it, it seems like sort of Netanyahu you know, just reigns forever, and uh, nothing can shake his... Uh, his rule, and then on the other hand, on the, on the left or center left, the, these new um, uh, potential rival parties seem to rise and then disintegrate. And the latest example of that is, is, is blue and white. Of course, we have the Kadima uh, example from the, from the early 2000s. What's, what's the secret of Netanyahu's longevity? How come his base seems to remain as strong as ever, even though there are fractions on the periphery of his coalition? Well, it, it also has to do with Israel's electoral system. Netanyahu doesn't need a majority uh, an absolute majority of the of the Israeli public. He has a loyal a base that is, uh, you know, around 25 uh, seats. It's uh, it's a considerable number that support the Likud. And the Likud today is pretty much uh, uh, the Likud and Netanyahu are to some extent one. And uh, and Netanyahu is able to communicate with his base. He's, he became the most competent. Uh, 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 player in, in the digital sphere, and he manages to communicate directly uh, 
with his base of supporters uh, without reliance on the, in the media and uh, the mediators uh, in the traditional media. And uh, so, uh, uh, and, uh, and after so many years in power, when uh, to some extent the, the, the trial and the corruption charges are all factored in and, and there's a, a number of Israelis that once they factor all of that in, they still appreciate Netanyahu's experience, leadership, it's, uh, his achievements and, and trust him. And, and in this respect, new data or new information is, uh, is in, uh, you know, in, in, uh, doesn't have much of an effect. So we see a, a considerable stickiness in the level of support for the Likud. I would say a floor of uh, around 25 uh, uh, seats. And, um, and, and another, um, uh, um, I would say, basic tenet of Netanyahu's uh, uh, support, uh, Netanyahu's support is uh, his uh, strong alliance uh, with the ultra-Orthodox parties. It's, uh, he, 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 uh, it, it, became, it, it, it was a, a, a pillar in his strategy from the mid-90s, making sure that he, he preserves and holds on to this uh, alliance uh, to some extent at all costs, and uh, and and he allows uh, you know in their issues the ultra orthodox parties whether it's in religion and state and uh, and uh, the, their education system and and, uh, and so on and they have um, sort of a hundred percent of their demands in return for a hundred percent of the premiership for Netanyahu on all other issues so it's an alliance that politically works well for both sides. Uh, Everybody can decide what what you know whether it's good or bad for the national interest. Um, and 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 finally, Netanyahu was actually very good at weaving together the right wing bloc, so including the settler parties and so on. It's it's I would say it's even a, 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 a conclusion that he drew from the uh, Y Plantation Accord back in the, in the late 90s that he doesn't want to break away from the Israeli right, and that's why. If I have to uh, uh, sort of point out one major political mistake that Mr. Netanyahu made was leaving Bennett out of the coalition as he formed that unity government, not insisting and doing the utmost to include Bennett because now we see that Bennett uh, 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 was an extremely effective uh, uh, opposition politician and is now no longer in a, part, a natural part uh, of uh, Netanyahu's bloc and might actually end up uh, ending Netanyahu's uh, uh, premiership. So right. uh, uh, beware of who you uh, 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 fire when you're a politician. Yeah. So uh, uh, meanwhile, a, a perceptive uh, viewer points out that we're missing Lieberman here. So we'll correct that in the version that we'll disseminate to everyone. But I trust you'll agree. He's definitely in the anti BB camp and the, the, the one flag that he seems to be waving that nobody else seems ready to pick up because of the political consequences is the uh, um, uh, sort of strident anti Haredi uh, uh, card and sort of uh, religious pluralism card, which I know is very important to a lot of people on this. Yeah, and, and actually, uh, uh, first of all, yeah, it's, it's a mistake. And, uh, and it actually j j strengthens the point of how fragmented the, the political map is because we are up from eight parties that up to 13. In, yeah. uh, in one cycle within a year. So yeah, it's... Uh... Yeah. Karni, let's, let's assume um, that a new reform-oriented government somehow miraculously comes to power after the March elections. Um, uh, what should they do to transform the current crisis into an opportunity to brighten Israel's long-term economic prospects? So... In general, I think the focus for, of economic policy should now start shifting from a basic safety net to supporting uh, recovery, green recovery, inclusive recovery. And the main pillars of that should be uh, investment in infrastructure, uh, which should include in transportation and in the internet uh, infrastructure and in digital, di digitalizing uh, uh, public services. And all of these areas were actually needed also before the pandemic, and they were needed in order to boost Israel's productivity, but now they're needed even more. And then the second uh, pillar should be uh, large scale retraining of people. 
uh, so as to uh, they, they, many people which will be unemployed also once the lockdown are, lockdowns are lifted uh, have inadequate skills uh, in order to to be integrated in the labor market post uh, the pandemic and uh, we do have we do see a very a large surge in the demand for the kind of products and services that Israel actually specializes in. If it's communication or digital health or, or cyber or FinTech or medical devices and so on and so forth. But we need to actually expand the um, uh, people that can work in these industries. And uh, there is a shortage of skilled people in these areas and in many other areas. So uh, there, uh, I think that uh, digital skills, for example, need to be provided on a very broad scale. Uh, we have, uh, strangely enough, Israel has a relatively low level of uh, digital um, proficiency of the population, but there are many, many other areas in which uh, skills can be upgraded. And unfortunately, actually, uh, we wasted a lot of time, but not uh, introducing a large uh, scale um, training program during the pandemic when people were actually out of work. So I think there are many areas uh, of green economy and of digital skills and so on that uh, were needed before, but they're more urgent at this stage and that should be the direction of policy. Yeah, Yohan, turning back to the US now and a lot of our um, viewers, a lot of participants on this call were I think un quite understandably preoccupied with uh, the transition in Washington, the elections, um, um, the transition from the Trump administration to the Biden administration. Um, how do you see that impacting um, Israel and maybe the election in particular? It's probably no secret that Biden would prefer someone else in Israel as prime minister and probably no secret that Netanyahu would have preferred a second Trump turn. Um, and of course, Netanyahu can't expect the same kind of pre-election gifts that uh, uh, he was used to, to receiving from, from, from Mr. Trump in, uh, over the past four years. Um, how, what, what do you see uh, this, the effect of this transition, monumental transition in Washington? Here? Well, it's a, it's a major uh, transition. Uh, if we look at how it affects Israeli politics, first of all, it, we have to uh, think of what it does not, which factor will no longer be a, a a, a part of the political cal calculation. And this is President Trump that uh, played an important role in Mr. Netanyahu's uh, previous campaigns, whether it was the Golan uh, Heights recognition uh, two weeks before the election or Netanyahu being able to sort of organize for himself an audience in the White House and present himself as, a, as another league and so on. So those uh, uh, cozy uh, meetings with the president that uh, uh, projected a message of, uh, of, a, of a, a global statesman that sort of uh, uh, has an open door in Washington. This is an asset that no longer is uh, available to Mr. Netanyahu that so far uh, did not uh, even uh, have a phone, uh, get a phone call from um, President Biden who sort of had in his phone list other uh, world leaders and he didn't get to Israel and so far we're still waiting. Um, so this is... Uh, on the one hand, Netanyahu lost his booster. Um, but um, when Israelis view uh, uh, the current uh, US administration, obviously from the Israeli vantage point and the Israeli interest and national interest, uh, the main issue that comes to mind is, the, uh, uh, is Iran. And uh, with respect to Iran now, the, attempt, the US attempt to uh, uh, return to some kind of a, a, a deal or a path that will, uh, um, uh, end the sanctions and create a, a, a deal that will uh, uh, restrict the enrichment of uranium rather than the current uh, limbo. Uh, is uh, the way this will be managed will be, I think, the main way that Israelis will view uh, the new administration for sure in the upcoming year, especially because the questions that have to do with the uh, West Bank and Palestinians and so on are pretty latent. Now, as long in as much as the Iranian issue 
there will be serious progress in the negotiation uh, during the upcoming uh, month, month and a half. Uh, and this will uh, 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 hurl uh, the Iranian issue into the agenda and frame the agenda. I think it would be good to the prime minister because the Israeli public perceives the Iranian issue as a strength of Mr. Netanyahu. So as long as that becomes an issue, uh, regardless of whether the Biden administration's act would, act would be perceived as good or bad for Israel, as long as it's an issue, it will be a good for Netanyahu that Israelis will see him dealing with the Iranian issue and not going to court, court uh, for the evidentiary phase of his uh, corruption trial. Interesting. Um, going back to Israel, I want to touch about the um, uh, touch upon the ultra orthodox issue. Obviously, the, the whole question of the integration of this large and growing sector of Israel's population is, is enormously significant for Israel's long term economic prosperity, its democratic vitality, uh, you know how the country looks. Um, and you know, I know both of you have been involved uh, uh, in, in various hats, both before IDI and at IDI, in efforts to, to, to create policies that foster. Uh, the integration of that society. Something's happened. Something seems to be breaking. The ground seems to be shifting in recent months. Uh, Karnit mentioned the, you know, the differential rates of contagion, the selective enforcement. There's r rising resentment among non uh, uh, Haredi Israelis uh, about all these things. Um, what we said politically so far, it seems to be Lieberman's the only one who's really willing to, to make that sort of a calling card. Are we close to some kind of a tipping point? Do we need to reevaluate uh, our approach to this, this question? What do you think about the whole question of ultra-Orthodox integration in light of the pandemic um, going forward? Well, first of all, it's a huge question that requires an entire uh, webinar because the, it has- Come on, let's uh, make a note of that. That'll be our next one. Yeah. Political, economic, uh, uh, Jewish and democrat democratic, Jewish and democratic, uh, uh, Zionist implications, implications for Israel and diaspora. I mean, it's a major, major issue. And, uh, <clears throat> and you're right, Jesse, that uh, uh, the developments around the pandemic have, uh, uh, have brought us to a point where it's uh, uh, where uh, for a, a, a growing number of Israelis, the option of looking the other way and sort of imagining that there's no issue is, uh, is becoming less and less of an option. Now, ironically, there's a disparity between the sentiment that we measure and see and feel in, uh, in the Israeli main street, where Israelis are extremely frustrated uh, uh, as a result of the fact that there's a lockdown and their kids are not going to school and running around at home and so on. And in the majority of uh, of uh, ultra-Orthodox kids continue to go to the yeshivas and kolelim and higher yeshivas and, and, uh, and, and life continues with the instruction of the rabbis and, and it's all funded by the government. So this brings home the idea that uh, uh, the biz uh, continuing business as usual uh, will probably not uh, lead us in a, in, a, in a direction that will help integrate into the economy, into our uh, uh, democratic norms, this uh, 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 huge society. To some extent, there was, um, I would say, a ceasefire over the past few years. We said, well, let's let the rules of the, let's let uh, allow uh, Adam Smith to solve the problem and more and more ultra-Orthodox will join the workforce, are going to the higher, educa uh, higher education, acquiring skills, let's allow the change to uh, happen from beneath. But this, and some of these trend, it changes did take place, but at the same time, government policy, because of the uh, strong alliance, government policy showered more and more subsidies, increased the budgets for yeshivas and, and, and so on. And, 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 the, and therefore, when you look at the big numbers, uh, the direction is not, not more integration, but less. And, uh, uh, and Israelis are, uh, a growing number of Israelis are worried about it, but it's not manifested in the behavior of political parties because po Israeli politicians have internalized the fact that if you take on the ultra-Orthodox uh, uh, in, in a high likelihood, your political career will end, especially because you know the, the, it's almost impossible to build a, co a stable coalition without the ultra-Orthodox allies. So this was uh, 
This explains the disparity between what's happening uh, in the street, what are the numbers telling us, and the dynamics of the political system they're different, that are different. Having said that, the, so far the alternative to a Netanyahu plus ultra-Orthodox coalition, which is a, you know, a likely outcome, is another likely outcome of a, a, a left, right, and center coalition with a number of parties, Lieberman, Gidon Saar, Bennett, Lapid, the Labour, Meretz, all together joining together and, 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 and for the first time in many years without the ultra-Orthodox uh, uh, having veto power. And that might create the conditions for some changes, but uh, you know, it's uh, too early to tell. Karnid, what do you think about that? Uh, Yochan mentioned Adam Smith, that's your territory. Do we leave it to the hidden hand or, or do we need I, to- I, I think the, the hidden hand is not doing a very good job so far. Uh, I think that the trends are completely unsustainable when you see the increase in the share of the Haredi population uh, over the next uh, 20 or 30 years where they will become uh, more than, a, now they're about 11% uh, of the population, they will be uh, 25, 27%. And the fact that there was some pro there was progress in the integration of Haredi women in the labor market, but very 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 slow process with men. And also when they get into the labor market, they lack the skills to actually get um, decent jobs. And the overall support, public support of the, this population. Uh, is already very high, but it's going to uh, triple if the share of the population triples on a, a narrowing, uh, um, the burden is going to be uh, on narrowing shoulders of the rest of the population. I think it's really unsustainable. So unfortunately, our politicians are very short-sighted. Maybe generally politicians tend to be short-sighted. But uh, it's really unsustainable from an economic standpoint, also from a social. Uh, I mean, democratic standpoint, uh, Karnit, uh, you know, at IDI, we uh, uh, polled quite intensively also views of ultra Orthodox uh, population vis a vis democratic values and institutions. And we see that it's not only an economic challenge, but uh, yeah. attitude or attitudes towards basic. Uh, democratic norms such as equality between men and women, equality between Jews and non-Jews are, are those views are, uh, the, the numbers are very difficult to uh, digest and it's just a, a, a symptom of the extent of the challenge. And, uh, and, and you said the education system produces uh, um, um, young men and women that are uh, uh, difficult to employ in high levels of, uh, in, in high productivity industries, uh, well, they're not necessarily also producing uh, informed uh, uh, democratic uh, citizens. And this is a major challenge. Just if I am allowed to pick, I would say it's probably the, the biggest uh, uh, challenge that the way we deal with it will shape our uh, future as a prosperous Jewish and democratic state. Yeah, I agree with oh, that. Yeah. If that's true, then it definitely uh, merits at least one additional session with the Jewish Funders Network in the future. We'll, <laughs> we'll work on that. We're reaching the end of our time. So again, if there's any last questions out there, please, uh, uh, this is the opportunity. Uh, maybe uh, one thing that's, that seems to be interesting to people is what, to, what should we be looking out uh, for during the rest of the campaign? I mean, there's six weeks left. Anything can happen. Nothing can happen. What do you think we should be looking out for as we read the morning papers? Uh, well, we spoke. <laughs> we spoke about the Arab uh, vote that uh, may may have a, a dramatic implication, and uh, and U.S. policy, assuming Iran becomes a major issue. Of course, in Israel, security is always an issue that can completely uh, change the agenda, whether it's uh, from the north, Hezbollah, uh, from the south, uh, Hamas, or from the northeast, uh, 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 Syria and Iran. Uh, all of these can completely uh, uh, shape the agenda. And, and we've seen it in past election campaigns. It's not uh, uh, it's something new. The prime minister's trial, I'm trying to think whether I want to say that it's a factor because uh, in, 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 in some, in, 
to some extent, I think it's factored into the calculation of the electorate, but we still haven't had a situation of a, of a prime minister that is in the uh, deep intensive part of his uh, trial evidentiary phase, speaking to his lawyers on a daily basis, as he also ne needs to manage a pandemic. And we see that the management of the pandemic is not left to the professionals, but rather very intensively run and managed by the politicians with ample political uh, calculations. So, that, so the fact that for the first time Israelis will see uh, how, how the, you know, the functional difficulty of a prime minister that is engaged both in a trial and in managing the affairs of the state, uh, that can uh, have uh, an effect. And, um, and finally, uh, obviously we, sp we spoke before about which parties will not cross the threshold. So what will happen in the lower parts of the uh, league will determine the outcome in, in the top, which parties will not cross the threshold will affect the top. And finally, and, and, and that, you know, to some extent we can end with what we started with, um, um, whether the vaccinations will produce an effect of uh, opening up in a sense of this crisis and nightmare is behind us, or whether the uh, variants and mutations will continue to spread and we will enter into a fourth lockdown in a, in a, in a national mood of uh, slog, that will very much uh, reflect, uh, uh, affect the uh, mood of Israelis and how they will uh, perceive the performance of the Prime Minister. Maybe I can add that in Israel, unlike in the US, economic policy is never uh, actually a main focus in the election campaigns. I haven't heard anything, almost anything, from politicians about what they uh, intend to, uh, to do on economic policy and dealing with the crisis. It's quite, uh, quite different than what you're used to in the US. Although, Karnit, for the first time, our numbers indicate that Israelis, at least the way they self-identify, they say that they will determine who to vote for in, in higher numbers as a result of uh, social and economic considerations rather than security ones. But, but it's I don't completely, believe it. yeah. But it's completely absent from the uh, political discussion around the elections. Yeah, and, 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 and as an expert, you can probably uh, testify that even if the public wants to vote based on economic, the differences in economic policies, it's pretty difficult to discern and identify what the differences are in those areas, as opposed to other areas such as the uh, rule of law and independent judiciary, where we see that there's a stark difference between the, the different uh, players. Yeah, that's, a, and that's a, a good reminder for all of us who care about U.S. and Israel and, and study them and, and, and travel frequently between them, that what we know about the political context in one of our two beloved countries doesn't necessarily apply one to one uh, to the other. So I think we'll um, uh, draw to a close here. I want to thank uh, uh, JFN and Tamar for, for hosting us. I want to thank my uh, colleagues, uh, Karnit Slug, the Vice President of Research, and the William Davidson Senior Fellow for Economic Policy at IDI and Johan Plesner, President of IDI. And Tamara, I'm going to hand it back to you. Thank you, Jesse. And thank you, Johanan and Karnit. What an interesting um, and engaging conversation. I think everybody has a lot to digest. And I also heard you, you mentioned it, and I also heard there's a lot of other a lot of other topics that we can dive into. So I look forward to continuing our partnership. I know we've been able to host Johanan and other people from IDI. Um, in this past few years, and we look forward to continuing to do that. So thank you all again, and thank you for everybody that participated in this. If you have further questions, you can reach out to me and please look out in your emails for further programs that we hope to have in the next um, bunch of months. So thank you all and stay well. <laughs>